From time to time on this show, we like to set aside a couple of minutes to discuss some of the common apologetics used in defense of theism. But this is not one of those times. No, it's not. Because today we're going to be discussing an uncommon apologetic used in defense of theism. <laughs> exactly. It's good that this one is uncommon. Yeah, right, right. So, Heath, what maundering, nonsensical slight against sanity do you have for us today? That would be the argument from happy slavery. Happy slavery argument. That sounds made up. <laughs> well, all ideas are made up. No, no, I mean, it sounds like you just now made it up. <laughs> well, the world would be a better place if I had to make it up just now. But no, this is an apologetic you can find in any number of books, videos, and websites trying to reconcile the moral grotesqueries of the Bible. It's all over the place. Okay, so when is a person likely to encounter this one? Anytime a person tells you the Bible is a book of morals, and then you correct them by pointing to its predilection for endorsing human bondage. Or, anytime you open your inbox, if you critique the Bible on a podcast every week. Yes, uh huh. But for the purposes of this bit, I'm still going to pretend I've never heard it before. So, how is this one formally stated? Okay, well, it's more of a reactionary argument, so you're not usually going to get it stated formally. But if you did, it might go something like this, I guess. Um, premise A, la la la. Premise B, ibid. Conclusion, I can't hear you. Something tells me that the person presenting this argument wouldn't agree with your characterization of it there. <laughs> they probably wouldn't even understand my characterization of it there. All right, so break it down for us. In the real world, how is this argument used? All right, the argument proceeds in stages. The first step is to convince the challenger that slavery in the Bible wasn't really that bad. I see. It was fun slavery. And what's the next step? We'll find that out if any of these apologists ever get past step one. Yeah, which that's kind of what I was figuring. Seems like a tough sell. <laughs> it is. But to their credit, that hasn't stopped them from trying. A number of justifications for biblical slavery have been offered that seek to divorce it from the associations we all have with slavery today. The, the associations like associations, I guess, owning yeah. slaves, right, for yes, example? The, the bad stuff like that, yes. They prefer you ignore that part of it. But barring that, they'll settle for asserting that there are many subtle levels of slavery, and biblical slavery was on the happy end of that scale. Well, uh, but, okay, but slavery is slavery. Either you own a person or you don't. There, I mean, there could be varying levels of how poorly you treat your slaves, but don't own people, that's a moral absolute. Okay, so this is the point where the apologist would play up the gray areas. For example, a person who has a job is, at least in some sense, a slave, if you think no, about it. No, they're not, because being an employee and a slave are two completely different things. But they still have people telling them what to do. Right, okay, but slave isn't defined by whether or not you have people telling you what to do. We all have people telling us what to do. Yeah, so in a sense, we're all slaves. Well, then the term would be meaningless. Look, slave has a very specific definition here. Slave, noun, a person who is the legal property of another and is forced to obey them. But if you keep reading... Then I'd be reading the definition for Slavic, because that's all it says. <clears throat> Two, verb, work excessively hard. Well, okay, but that's not even... We're not talking about that definition. Nonsense. I just brought it up, so of course we're talking about it. Well, I... Okay, I mean, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about owning the slaves in the Bible. Well, to be fair, we should consider... All the definitions, I think. No, we shouldn't, because you can't own a verb. That wouldn't even make sense. You can't own a slave, either. Well, not legally, but that's not the point. What is the point? I don't even... That, that employees aren't slaves. No, but they're like slaves, aren't they? No, they're not. See, well, they're not slaves light. The boss isn't, like, legally allowed to rape them or beat them with a rod, regardless of how quickly they recover. And if you don't like what you're being asked to do, you can quit. Okay, sure. So y you get mad at your boss for raping and beating you, so you quit. But what then? You hire a lawyer and try to get that rapist thrown in jail. Okay, but in the meantime, how are you going to pay your bills or feed your children? I'm going to get a different job. And what about little Tommy's chemo? Is your new job going to have insurance that pays for that? What does that even have to do with anything? Well, for you or me, it might be easy to quit a job just because we got raped and beaten. But for some people, caught in the cycle of poverty, it's not that simple. So for some people... Having a job and being a slave aren't very different at all. Well, okay, but for the record, I'm also morally opposed to bosses that beat and rape their employees. Yeah, but back in the Bible days, there weren't exactly, you know, OSHA regulations or labor unions, so it's awful culturally insensitive for you to try to view this all through your modern lens, I would say. It's culturally insensitive to be anti-slavery? Anti-Bible slavery, yeah, absolutely. We're not talking about Django Unchained here. This is more like... 
Shmuel Unchained. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm the one being culturally insensitive now. The point is that you're using your preconceived Western notions of slavery and trying to apply them to a system in the Bible that wasn't the same. We call both of those things slavery now, but the institution was different back then. The Bible talks about a far kinder and gentler version of owning people. It says you can beat them with a stick. It tells you not to knock their eyes out, though. It's very clear you know, on but that. Somehow that doesn't quite elevate it to morally sound in my mind. Sorry. Well, it, it differs in other ways, too. For example, in Bible slavery, you had to let your slaves go after seven years. Only the Hebrew ones. Well, the other ones are just lucky you didn't massacre them when you were genociding all the other men in their tribe. But even that's, even that's with the Hebrew slaves, there's still groups. that loophole where you get to keep the slaves' kids, and if they ever want their kids back, then they have to pledge to be your slave forever, and you drive the owl through their ear. They, they spell that one out in Deuteronomy. Yeah, the argument from happy slavery works out better if you don't know about that. Well, okay, but even if I didn't, assuming I didn't, it seems like it would be fairly easy to argue that owning somebody as property for seven years is still morally repugnant. Okay, well, if you think any point is fairly easy, you clearly haven't argued with enough Christians before. Okay, so what's your answer then? How should we deal with the argument from happy slavery? <laughs> I actually have a three-step system. Step one is driving an awl through their ear into the door jam. Uh -huh. After that, you beat them with a stick, taking care not to knock out any eyes or teeth. And then when they get up and start walking around again, a couple days later, ideally about 47 hours later, uh -huh. either they'll admit they were wrong and that being a biblical slave sucks, or they'll still hold the same position and you can beat them unconscious with the stick again. Okay. Just keep All right. I'm, not, I'm not sure how well that would going. work in a formal debate, but I'd be willing to give it a try. You will not be disappointed. All right. Well, Heath, thanks again, sir.